Great. Okay. Cool. So, Lou Marcos, thanks very much once again for joining us on Hermetics Podcast. Great to be back. So, we're going to be discussing uh, this beautiful hardback book, uh, well, beautiful book, Reading Greek and Roman Mythology Through Christian Eyes, The Myth Made Fact, uh, which is published by... Classical Academic Press, I believe. Yeah, Classical Academic Classical Press. Academic Press. Uh, 2021, this was published. And as you can imagine, this is um, sort of, you know, our last chat was about your book about Platonism and Christianity. And this book is really not a continuation, but it's something that's broadening the scope of that. And it is about Greek and Roman myths through Christian eyes. But it's equally a really great introduction to biblical study, uh, a really great introduction in a way to understanding the, 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 the progression of, of spiritual development and also there's some really great exercises in there you know you basically the structure of the book mm. is there's a myth then there's your commentary on it in terms of viewing it through christian eyes and then there is a, a host of exercises which also connect to your other scholarly work such as tolkien c.s lewis etc so uh yeah i mean just to start how did this uh, how did this book come about well, it's great. I mean, you know, I, I published uh, From Achilles to Christ, Why Christians Should Read the Pagan Classics, it's been about 12 years ago. Uh, and in that book, I dealt with the Iliad, the Odyssey, the Aeneid, and the Greek tragedies, which I love. But behind all of those tragedies and epics and things are really the raw material of myth itself. I've grown up, my, all four of my grandparents were born in Greece, emigrated to America about 1930 during the Depression. And you know, I've just grown up with Greek mythology and I knew it. It took a while to get there, but I knew at some point I wanted to do another book where I went deeper. Let's get down to the roots. Uh, and, and, you know, I'm a huge fan of Jordan Peterson, although he's not a believer yet. He's there. He's getting close, James. Uh, again, he is also playing on those archetypes, which I love, you know, like him. I, I, I enjoy a Joseph Campbell or a, a Carl Jung. You have to read them with caution. They got a lot of problems with them. But, you know, the basic idea of archetype, I mean, just, just like, what's his name? Uh, uh, Sir James Frazier, who wrote The Golden Bow, huge influence on Lewis. He wasn't a believer, Frazier, but there's stuff in there that I think can energize our faith and give us new eyes to see. So all along, I wanted to write this. And, you know, I, I knew I wanted to take 50 myths, and then I wanted to analyze them on their own, but show how they pointed forward to Christ. Well, my original book was, I don't know, 50, 60,000 words. And I sent it to Classical Academic Press. And James, they said something that a publisher never says. They said, Lou, we love this book. <laughs> and we want it to be twice as long. You know That's anything right. about publishers? It's always make it twice as short. Right? So what I did is I expanded and I added all those notes, which give, give more historical biographical background. Uh, and then... I added all those questions so that the book can serve a wide range of audience. And you probably noticed that all those questions I ask, some of them are, are okay for grammar school. Some of them are for high school, some of them for college, some of them for adults. I mean, it's really any age, there's going to be something there that you can wrestle with. It's a good thing for you know reading groups or maybe a, an adult Bible study where you want to get together and read one or two myths devotionally. And whatnot. And what's really interesting, James, is the way I put that together, because I've never done a curriculum book that had that many questions in it. I don't usually do that. I always have a few. But what I did is I sort of look back over the last 15 years at all the public lectures I've given. And I thought about all the Q&A sessions that I've done all these years and the kinds of questions that I was asked most commonly, the interest, the cue, and that's kind of how I put that together by re just remembering the concerns of regular people in the audience who want to know more. Uh, and so I love it because, it, and, and they they made it hardcover with all the beautiful illustrations. And I mean, they just went all out. I've, I've never had a publisher invest so much in the book itself. And in fact, if you or your listeners have Audible or, or whatever the UK version of that is, this is the only time it's happened. After the book came out, they got me to do the audiobook version where I read it out loud. So that was a lot of fun. And if you have Audible, it's on there. You just type in the myth made fact. Uh, and then I did a lecture series version of it for their classical academic university. That's a, that's a subscription service. And all. So I've been really kind of thrown, you know, so head first into the myth. And of course, it all comes out of C.S. Lewis's, you know, that Jesus is the myth made fact. That idea is always in the back of my mind. So let's get people to dig into these myths, people of all ages, and see that a wrestling with these myths can 
affect our beliefs and our behavior. That they're fun, but they're also engaging and challenging. Mm. And so that's kind of the whole panoply that I wanted. Mm. Well, my, my sort of series of questions are generally devised. I mean, we could, of course, we can draw on the specific myths and and, uh, 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 and the specifics of, of specific Greek and Roman myths. But my questions really are around um, uh, the, the broad strokes that are happening with this book. And, and, and also uh, a beautiful, very short little thing you write them at the start, a note on virtue, which I, I reread a couple of times because I was like, uh, this is so great. Um, but but so really, we're beginning from the foundation, which is, I guess, best articulated by someone such as Dante, which is pagans are on the first level of hell, right? It's like... Yes. You you know it's like you you're not really there because you you didn't know you didn't know you got right. as close as you could right so there's is is this generally your understanding that pag, uh, pagan or Greek or Roman myths really are they, they are built from what they had they didn't have revelation good they said you know he calls them the virtuous pagans uh, you know the Plato and Socrates and Aristotle the great poets and things like that and and uh, you know it, again. But part of the understanding is, and this may have bothered you, James, it's like, are you telling me that until Jesus came, God ignored 99% of the human population? Well, only to the Jews did he give direct revelation, but he spoke through general revelation, through creation, through nature, through uh, our conscience, through our imagination, through our reason. He spoke, right? And and again, we, you know, we don't know exactly what happens. You know, maybe, I mean, here's just something that Lewis suggests in The Great Divorce. Okay, it says, okay, you know, in the original Apostles' Creed, it says he, he suffered and was buried. He descended into hell, and then he ascended into heaven, right? And this is what we call the harrowing of hell. It plays a very important role in Dante's Divine Comedy. Uh, so that C.S. Lewis, uh, Lewis, that Dante is literally following in the footsteps of Jesus who harrowed hell. And and it, it also says, and I can't remember, was it Ephesians or, or maybe Peter? It said that, Jesus went down and preached to those in the prison, right? And what Lewis says in The Great Divorce is, you know, that that event we, we call the heroine of hell, that in a sense happened outside of time and space. That was an eternal thing. So in one sense, there is no prisoner to whom Jesus has not preached from the beginning to the end. Now, we don't know. The Bible doesn't tell us enough to understand this. We know that salvation is only through Christ, but is there some way that, Christ appeared to them. Lewis played with these ideas. Uh, by the way, Dante plays with those ideas too. When he gets to Paradiso, he meets two people that should not be there. What are they doing there? All right. One of them is uh, uh, Trajan, right? Who was was a good Roman emperor, you know, fairly pious Roman emperor. And there was a story. Lewis didn't make the story up, but there was a story that the great Pope Gregory the Great. There's very few popes that have been called the Great. There's like three of them. And Pope Gregory the Great, around 600 AD, uh, the story was that he had such a deep love for uh, Trajan and his justice that he prayed and prayed and prayed so that God raised him from the dead long enough for Pope Gregory to preach the gospel to him so he could die and go to heaven. Right? Wonderful. The second one, though, almost everybody believes Lewis made this up because it doesn't appear anywhere else. We actually meet a guy named Riffius. Who the heck is Riffius? Riffius is a Trojan that appears in one line of the Aeneid. Aeneid Book 2 is the fall of Troy. And as Troy is being destroyed, it says, and then they killed Riffius, the Greeks, Riffius, who was the justest of the Trojans. And, you know, whatever Virgil says is, 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 is gospel, right? So what's going on? So uh, Dante comes up with this myth that, in a dream, Christ appeared to Riffius and gave him a vision of Christ to come. The same thing that Abraham and Moses put their faith in, of Christ to come. And he was saved by his belief in that special dream that was given him. Now, Lewis and Dante's not saying we have to believe that. What he's saying is God's grace is a pretty amazing thing. And we're really not sure how God works all of these things out. But the fact is, that we can learn real things from these virtuous pagans. That's why I'm all into what we call classical Christian education, that we can learn from Homer and Virgil and, and, and Sophocles and Aeschylus and Plato and Cicero, and God forbid, even Ovid, okay? We can learn some real truths from these folks. As people, Marcus Aurelius, the Stoic, we can learn a great deal about duty and honor. Now, again, as Christians, 
we measure it against the touchstone of scripture. But there is, again, the, the maybe the easiest way to put it, James, is that a lot of times the pagans don't have the final answer, but they ask the questions really well. So it says in the Bible, we see dimly in a mirror, right? Through a glass darkly. Well, maybe the pagans saw very dimly in a dirty mirror, but they saw something. And we can learn from that and it can lead us towards the greater truth. So what would you say to people who might argue that in doing so, in do, in, in seeing the, uh, the, these myths or as a continue, oh, sorry, seeing the teaching of Jesus as a continuation of these myths, what would you say to people who might might argue, well, are you are you just projecting Christianity on them? In some sense, that you, you're altering the 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 idea and the and the myth, which is already self contained in the story, and you're just finding a way, perhaps, to alter it to your own to your own uh, goal. Would you say that's a misunderstanding of Christianity? I would. It might help instead of using the word continuation. Maybe if we use the word consummation, that it reaches its fullness of meaning, because we are human beings. Okay, the whole Iliad is about the about Achilles raging against his own mortality. I mean, he's angry at Agamemnon, and then he's angry at Hector. But what he's really struggling with is his own mortality. He knows that he was meant to be a god. Well, guess what, folks? We were all meant to be eternal in the garden. And I believe that in the same way that we all participate in the sin of Adam, what we call original sin, in Adam's fall, we sinned all. I believe that we also participate in whatever, the two days. Uh, Milton is, is liberal. He gives them like three days. Uh, for the two days we had in the garden, I believe we have an antenatal memory of Eden and that we do have an understanding. And we do even have an understanding of our sinfulness. Now, the ancient Greeks and Romans, they didn't have an exact understanding of sin because you can't have sin unless you have a holy God to measure against. But they certainly understood what we call taboo. They certainly understood that there were crimes that brought ritual guilt, like the incest and patricide in the Oedipus story or the matricide in the Oresteia where Orestes kills his mother or, uh, or, or um, um, a Clytemnestra kills her husband Agamemnon, or Agamemnon sacrifices his daughter Iphigenia, uh, or cannibalism. They're, they have an understanding that there is guilt that brings a sort of ritual guilt that even corrupts the, the city, right? I mean, that's in the Bible. When, 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 uh, when one of the kings of Israel or Judah is evil, it has a terrible impact on their city, right? On their nation. And then, I mean, God was ready to destroy Judah right after he destroyed Israel in 722. And lo and behold, good King Hezekiah and good, jo good King Josiah come along. And it seems like God partly extended the southern kingdom of Judah for 150 years until 586, partly because of those good rulers. So the Bible, too, has that same reflection of the leader. Uh, you, you know your Shakespeare. A lot of times uh, uh, Hamlet, the, the, his father, the king of Denmark, is often referred to as Denmark. Right, because he embodies, he's, he's Hamlet, but sometimes he's just Denmark or Scotland because he's embodying that. So there's a notion uh, even in those. Now, here's the cool thing, and someday I hope we find this, James, because if you're into Norse mythology, and Lewis loved Norse mythology, and Tolkien loved it even more than Greco-Roman, I think you probably understand that we have no original Norse mythology written by the pagans themselves. Everything we have the Eddas and, and the Volsung saga were all written down by Christians, including Beowulf in England, right? We're all written down by Christians. Uh, and I would love to compare the two. And yet they may have gotten it right because we've got all the primary material, material by Homer and Virgil and Ovid and all these people. And it's amazing how it lines up. It, it, it's, it's like an intimation of the greater knowledge to come. Now, now again, it's not, and I do believe that Sometimes the God of the Bible used some of that stuff to prepare the pagan people for the coming of Christ. So that when Paul says at Mars Hill, now, therefore, what you have worshipped in ignorance, I will proclaim to you as known. I think that says it all. Right. So. Early on, and I mean, you know, this is such a beautiful little thing that you added, you, you cite uh John Henry Newman, Cardinal Newman, and you you cite his um, his idea of basically there being a, a shadow uh, of a shadow of God in all that is good, and I guess that's my question to you in, in relation to what we're talking about this idea of a, a consummation of this of this. There's always mm -hmm. something there, even if they didn't have the revelation. Is how can one retrieve that shadow 
from things which aren't quintessentially Christian. Wow. I mean, it, it does. I mean, it's just sort of what it says in the Bible. You have eyes, but do not see and ears, but do not hear. We have to sort of train ourselves to see them. And we start doing that's why all those questions, when we start wrestling with the issues raised by the myths and start thinking about that, then we can realize that the ultimate answer does come in Christianity. So mythology is man reaching up, groping, trying to understand, trying to under it. Because I think even the pagans understood in their own language that we're made in God's image, but fallen. They, they saw the, the, the divinity in us that made us capable of such greatness. And then they saw the terrible deeds we did, the limits that we have, all that sort of stuff. And so if that's mythology, then Christianity is God reaching down to us and revealing himself, general revelation as opposed to special revelation. Um, and again, what we're seeing is that they're human, right? We, we all know that this is C.S. Lewis talks about the Tao, T-A-O. He uses that word to mean the universal cross-cultural moral code. That it, to a certain extent, we all know that we should live a certain way, but we all know that we don't live that sort of way. And if we're really uh, uh, honest, we know that we can't live that way. <laughs> and yet religion says, we'll just keep trying harder, right? Then we finally have the revelation of grace in Christ saying, no, you really can't do it, right? But we don't seek out grace until we realize we can't do it. And sometimes that takes a lot of stumbling and a lot of trial and error to really see and understand our need. And then, you see, see, the way Lewis would put it is the, okay, he says, imagine a child trying to draw a circle, right? Kind of shaking and all that sort of stuff, right? Well, if one day you showed him a perfect circle, he wouldn't say, what's that? He would say, that's what I was trying to do. Now I see it, I recognize it. That's what I was trying to do. So one hopes that some of the right, the, the virtuous pagans might recognize later the truth of what they were only reaching and groping for. Because that's what it says. Out of, uh, again, Acts 17, out of one man, God created all races of men, set their times and places, though he is not far from any of us. So, he said, so that they might reach after and grope after him, though he is not far from any of us, for him and we live and will never be. So there is that, that sense of groping and reaching. And you know what? I hope a Chinese Christian will write a book like mine, looking at their own mythology or someone from Japan or India or something like that. Uh, and trying to find it. Now, in Paradise Lost, what Milton shows, interestingly, is all the other mythologies of the Asian culture, Babylon, Persia, Phoenicia, uh, uh, Carthage, Carthage, and all that, 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 those are more like the demonic ones. And then the Greco-Roman Norse ones were still not true, but they were closer. They lived in the cold middle ground, as he says in Paradise Lost, uh, getting ready for that not quite as corrupt. And that's why um, in uh, book one and book two of, of, of Paradise Lost, all of the sort of Asiatic, the, the bad guys, like I said, Assyria, Babylon, Persia, Phoenicia, Philistines, all of them end up taking the name, the, the demons end up taking their names from Moloch to Baal to Dagon, all of those. But then they, they're not necessarily taking on Jupiter. They're up in the kind of cold middle ground. Like God is using them to prepare the way. Mm. So I mean, it, it, as as the only thing which isn't isn't there to, to to lead them to the full truth to that perfect circle, as you say, is really is revelation. Is is it the revelation of Christ and the life of Christ? Do you think there's anything else there which is key, which which you know disallowed them to make that full leap? Mm. Well, if we go back to Dante, okay, the virtuous pagans, that that's what, what's called limbo, right? Uh, and those that the virtuous pagans are not experiencing any active suffering, but they lack hope. And what Dante says is when they come on that ring, he hears a sound like this. Ah, oh, this is sort of a sigh, right? And they can't move beyond it because they cannot even imagine the glory of the true heaven and the true Christ. And what's interesting is when you look at Dante's description of limbo, uh, the virtuous pagans, it reads just like their version of the Elysian Fields. In some ways, the closest the pagans came to understanding it is what you get at the end of, of the Apology of Socrates when he describes it. You also get it in Virgil's Aeneid, Book 6, the Elysian Fields, also known as the Blessed Groves. Uh, and so, in a, in a way, Dante's giving them 
the limit of their desire. And we always have to go back to C.S. Lewis, James. Uh, you know, again, those who truly desire heaven will not miss it. Because to truly desire heaven is to desire God. Because heaven means dwelling eternally in the presence of the triune God. So uh, remember the end of the last battle with Emeth, whose name means truth in Hebrew. If your desire had not been for me, says Aslan, the Christ King, then you would not have sought so long or so hard. All get what they desire. I do not say they always like it. <laughs> but what is our true desire that moves beyond that? And for, and for this to happen, we we really need to move to the title and stay within this within this Lewis tradition, the myth made fact. So, what exactly does this mean, and what leap is being made there? And I guess, in a certain sense, I mean, when when I read this title, of course, it's, it's as you said, it's coming from Lewis. But I always think about it in, uh, if, if I'm sure you're aware of his work, but Rene Girard always talks about this: how how oh, the yeah. idea of the scapegoat is really to do with myth. You know, they've they've found a false god and they apply everything to him, and then along come, comes the real god, and all of a sudden. Satan casts out himself because he's, you know, he's come face to face with the real deal. He can no longer use myth to well, forget his I, I, I love Gerard. Yeah, all of his stuff about scapegoating and, and uh, my nieces and things like that. And I think he's, I think he's really on to something. And, and, you know, even, you know, I was reading a new book about natural theology and saying that, you know, even Calvin understood this, that the fact that we give, as a human species, the fact that we give way to idolatry is proof that we do have a census divinity, a sense of the divine, or we wouldn't, so we, we see it, we recognize it in creation, but rather than seek out the creator, we turn around and make idols out of the creation. Uh, so we, we, we don't get beyond that. Uh, and in that sense, we are without excuse. Um, and, and we're not working for our salvation. Uh, it does need a revelation of grace. Uh, now, the myth may fact is wonderful. I, again, most of your viewers will know that uh, Lewis was an atheist for half his life. A lot of people don't realize, though, that Lewis didn't go directly from atheism to Christianity, like a Josh McDowell or something. He became a theist, and he was there for about a year and a half until he became a believer. What was holding him back? Lewis was a fan of, I mentioned earlier, the Golden Bough. The Golden Bough works out this archetype of the corn god or the corn king, the dying and rising god, Osiris, uh, Adonis, Balder, Mithras, uh, 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 who's the other one? Um, uh, Tammuz, all these names, right? And and what for now, Fraser was a Victorian, so he didn't come out and say he didn't believe in Jesus. He left that up for Joseph Campbell to say. But he still, his implication is that Jesus is just the Hebrew version of the corn king. And that's what Lewis thought. That was holding him back. What do I care if a rabbi died 2,000 years ago? What does that have to do with me? And then he had that talk with Tolkien, J.R. Tolkien, strong Catholic. And Tolkien said to him, you know, what if Jack, his nickname, right? What if Jack, the reason that Christ sounds like a myth is that he's the myth that was made fact. So again, why is it that all over the world, this same archetype keeps popping up of the dying and rising God? How can that be? Well, it only makes sense if we were all created by the same creator who put that same desire, that deep yearning inside of us that manifests itself in all these different myths, most of which, though, are very bloody and very scary. But if that's true, then doesn't it make sense that when God actually affects our salvation, he would do it in a way that fits the yearning and desire of all the nations? Because James, if Jesus came into the world and he fulfilled the Old Testament law and prophets, but what he did was absolutely foreign to the other 99% of the human civilization, then he would be the Jewish Messiah, but he wouldn't be the savior of the world. So maybe the best way I can put it is in the same way that Jesus fulfills the Old Testament law and prophets, I believe he fulfills all the highest yearnings of the pagan people. So, I mean, perhaps, perhaps this is a simplistic question, but in terms of, you know, it's, it's often something that's spouted by <clears throat> atheists as a sort of a rationalist argument against uh, religion, right? It's like, well, if you look at the history, we're just creating the same myth and they never really use their logic to think, well, if that same thing's been touted all along, right. maybe maybe there's something in it, right? And they go, oh, the same thing's been created again and again and again. So what is it? I mean, perhaps in almost narrative terms, what is the key difference for, for Christ in relation to those other corn god Good. myths? Okay, first of all, it, and most importantly, it is historical. 
it happens at a specific time and place. All the other ones are mythic. It doesn't really make a difference when they happen. It's only the idea that's important. But as Lewis says, but it, you know, but Jesus was crucified under Pontius Pilate. It's all in order. It happened at a specific time and a specific place, and so it's historical. It's also a real incarnation, not the uh, the offspring of basically a divine rape, which is often the case with all the other ones, right? This is a virgin birth, uh, a real person, and it's a real death and a real resurrection. Because most of the other corn king myths are basically seasonal myths. The life, death, and rebirth of the cycle of the grain, right? And now you know, because you're in England, that British people, for whatever reason, use the word corn to mean wheat. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm sorry, use the word wheat to mean, uh, sorry, they use the word corn to mean wheat, right? Mm -hmm. uh, if they want to say corn like Americans, they will say maize. Right. So it, it's kind of confusing to Americans. Corn king really means wheat king. Right. Uh, mm. There was no there was no corn in the old world until Columbus. Right. Uh, that comes from the new world over here mm. on my side of the pond. So the corn king is following the cycle of the wheat. Right. Mm. The, the death, the birth, the re uh, John Barleycorn, if you know your Robert Burns, uh, as it's being beaten and trilled around. the turf. So it, again, it's a seasonal myth. It's not a once and for all atoning death followed by a bodily resurrection that is eternal so it's just got the basic idea it's also usually very bloody and whatnot of course the crucifixion is bloody too but i mean it's more horrific sometimes um it, so it, it it's just the idea that the, the knowledge that that we are broken off from the gods in some way and there needs to well go back to rene gerard that there needs to be the scapegoat mm -hmm. but there needs to be something that brings us back. And and by the way, all of the, the golden bow started by trying to figure out what that thing is, the golden bow that Virgil is carrying into the underworld. I'm sorry, Aeneas is carrying into the underworld. He decides it's the mistletoe, interestingly enough, the thing that killed uh, Balder. Um, but he talks about a lot of other, you know, the, the whole idea of, you know, in a tribal religion where they choose me to be the sacrifice and I get to have a, a year of, a year on the top. Life is great. And then I'm sacrificed. And then that sort of thing. Uh, and so that's the difference. It's historical. It's once for all. And it is all. And, and it's it's really, really redemptive in a way that the other ones are. So, I mean, I mean, just to draw a couple of things in, I, I believe it's from Matthew, though I may be wrong. This I, this 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 notion of separating the wheat from the chaff almost oh, makes good, me good. think back to screw tape letters, oh. right? So screw tape letters is. The whole world is upside down, so hell is heaven and heaven is hell. You know? oh, good, yeah. the, the, the enemy is God, right? So it seems like to separate from the wheat from the chaff is to accept that the world has been turned the wrong way. And it's actually like, no, now the, 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 the true, uh, the fact can actually separate the real wheat from the chaff, which was originally the corn gods. Or maybe oh, I'm a, maybe I'm a, it's a no, bit no, of a stretch. It, it, no, but, it, but it's interesting, James, because when you follow out the, the speech at the Areopagus, you know, uh, you wear his offspring, he says that, you know, God has chosen a man that will be the judge right that will judge so far you're innocent the way i agree but now he has appointed a judge who will judge the world and he has given evidence of that judge by raising him from the dead and that's when a lot of the greeks say, whoa 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 why would you want to raise him from the dead i want to give it to my body but that's it's crazy right um so well, that, that is interesting though but yeah it, it's um it's um um yeah it, it's moving towards that reality it, it's you know just give just to give another example of, of, of all of this sort of fun stuff here. Um, I remember, you know, taking social studies. Nobody teaches history in our country anymore. Okay, <laughs> social studies, and I remember the teacher saying, "Now, children, we now know that every ancient people group has a story of a universal flood. Therefore, the Bible's a myth." And I remember, you know, there's another way to read that evidence, right? There's a difference between data and the interpretation of data. Mm -hmm. The data is. Everybody has a story of a universal flood. I guess you could say it's all a myth, but it makes a lot more sense to me to say that how could everybody have that memory unless there was an actual universal flood and in all the other cultures, it only came forward in mythic form, pure myth, but in the Bible, we get some of the historical myth. Right? But it depends how you read. Another one of my favorite examples I use, uh, I'm sure you're familiar with the word homology. This is what the Darwinians enter into. They'll show you a, a, a poster and it will show a man's arm. 
It'll show a bat's wing. It'll show the dorsal fin mm. of a dolphin. And all of them have the same basic uh, of, of blueprint, if you mm. want to say. Mm. And they're like, ah, proof of evolution. I'm like, not really. I see proof of a common designer who doesn't mm. keep reinventing the wheel every time he does something new. I mean, what I see is evidence of design, like a designer would use, and keep you know you keep using certain things that work, and you have other things. So it, again, it's data versus the interpretation of it. It all goes back to um, Freud in, in his book um, uh, 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 Moses and Monotheism, where he says what religion is is that we humans we took our earthly fathers and projected them onto heaven and created the heavenly father by a process he calls sublimation. Well, maybe, but it makes a lot more sense to me that earthly fatherhood is a lesser version or a falling away from divine fatherhood. Because, you know, I mean, I mean one of the very essences of science is that, you know, water does not rise above its level, right? The origin has to be greater than, the cause has to be greater than the effect. That's, that's sort of the essence of logic. And yet they want to turn it on its head and, and, and say, no, it's what we see. This is why... You know, we talked before about from Plato to Christ. Plato obviously didn't get everything right, but his understanding of the forms and of the origin and the and the imitation, I think there's great truth to that in the nature of reality and, and of Christianity. Mm -hmm. And I mean, it's always it's always interesting, sort of humorous to see how they they pull these. You know, like with the Darwin example. Or I mean, I re someone recently linked me an old Richard Dawkins thing where he 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 explains his whole thing, and at the end he sort of says, "So there must be something extremely." You know, unfathomably simple behind all this, and the audience laughs, and he can't understand. He says, "Why are you all laughing?" Right? He can't see it. But I mean, you know, there's there's many examples like that. I mean, I think I think the, the, the for the gravitational pull of all the our solar system to work, it couldn't be you know yeah. point fine tuning. Yeah, yeah, and people go, "Wow, what a coincidence!" Okay. Have you ever have you ever watched the David Attenborough's great uh, documentaries on nature? David Attenborough. I haven't spent too much time with him, even no, as, right. even as a Brit. We'll see him over here. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But not to be confused with Richard Attenborough, uh, but David Attenborough, he'll he'll show. I remember watching an episode of the insect world, and he shows this anthill, which if it was built by men would be a mile high. It's got its own uh, basically sanitation. It's, it's unbelievably complex in design from these you know ants that have a tiny little pea brain, right? And he looks at that and says, "The wonders of evolution." Excuse me, you mean <laughs> the wonders of undirected time and chance? Are you blind? I mean, it's crazy. That, that's one of the reasons why Pascal said that sometimes the argument by design doesn't work because the unregenerate just doesn't see it, refuses to see it. It's like so obvious. It's, it's right there in giant letters so big that you don't see it. Um, and so it, it is kind of crazy. But they do that. They, they move right up. You, you expect them to say, ah, like if I don't know if you've ever had a chance to read the um, autobiography of John Stuart Mill. I think it was Thomas Carlyle who called it the autobiography of the steam engine. Uh, <laughs> but he's, he's talking about going through this crisis of faith and you keep waiting for him to say and then i accepted christ and he never says it he becomes a utilitarian right uh and and uh, i know it's, it's just it is interesting though but but uh th this is you know why we've got romans one where without excuse it's god's power is clear in nature as it is clear in our conscience that's romans chapter two uh and we just we don't want to see and you know some of the new atheists have been more uh forthcoming and have admitted that well, I didn't want there to be a God because I wanted to sleep around when I was a kid. I mean, some of them have just been, I mean, none of us like accountability. Even Christian believers want to get around accountability. That's why we kind of tweak the scriptures to, to, to get around what we don't want them to say because we don't want to be accountable. You know, one of the things holding Lewis away from faith was also he just wanted to be left alone. It's like, God, I won't do any big bad sins. So just leave me alone. Stop being so intrusive. And that's it. We don't like accountability. And that's why uh, we, we prefer a sort of, you know, uh, weak need deism because, you know, Lewis said pantheism is, is the greatest religion of all, because when it's beautiful outside and the sun is shining, very rare, of course, in England, the sun is actually shining. Right. You want somebody to, to thank. Right. But when you want to do something rather, you know, shabby, it's nice to know that the universe doesn't really care. Mm. Okay, So, mm. it, it, I mean, really, we get down to the essence of it. That's often what's going on. Mm. The Pharisees don't want to believe. Which, I mean, actually jumps back to what you were saying about the um, 
the, you know, the idea of, oh, there's, there's been a great flood story for every civilization. And taking that in, I mean, of course, you can read the Bible in a literal way and you could take that as a literal thing and, 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 and look at it in, this, uh, in a historical way. But then there's also, the, the, you could argue, say, well, yeah, each civilization has had a flood myth. But in, in Christian terms, each civilization then has had, had the idea that the world needed washing. Right at a point oh, in time, point. at a point in time, right, everyone agreed. Yeah, things weren't good. Right, it, it, it needed. It need, we needed a cleanse. Um, the thought uh, of man was evil. Right? And and, and wow. this is this is one of the great things that you know really comes comes through in your book. Um, in 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 sort of, I mean, it's not explicitly said in it, is that it seems to be trying to teach something which is extremely mm-hmm. lacking in modern education. And I think, but maybe <laughs> maybe this ties back into your note on virtue, which is especially in the West and especially in England, because the English language isn't really great for it in a way, uh, our absolute lack of ability to really settle into allegory, to settle into myth, oh. to settle into that form of, you know, what does this mean? We're very uh, pragmatic thinkers, I think, today. And we're taught, right, true, we're yeah. taught in a way which, uh, you know, as you're talking about with, with, with virtue. Empiric- we're empiricists at heart. Yeah, so, I mean, uh, it's, a, it's a sort of question I wanted to ask you. Do, do you think we've lost our ability to really sit with allegory and, and uh, take our time with it, which which itself is a huge problem for the Bible, right? Because the most important yeah. lessons are parables. <laughs> yeah. And I mean, p- part of it, it, it does help because sometimes when it's a real pure allegory, some people, including Lewis and Tolkien, sometimes resist that because it seems so didactic, right? But when you're dealing with a parable or a myth, there's still a message there, but it's not always so one-to-one obvious sort of stuff, right? Uh, I mean, Lewis wrote an allegory called The Pilgrim's Regress, but the line that which in the wardrobe is really not an allegory. Aslan is not an allegory for Christ. Aslan is the Christ of Narnia. If there's a difference there, right? Uh, as, as Tolkien said, uh, that th- the Lord of the Rings is not an allegory. It's something that has layers of meaning that mm-hmm. you can apply. It has applicability rather than allegories, what he said. Um, and uh, Tolkien unfairly said that the Chronicles of Narnia were allegorical. That's not exactly right, you know, as, as an English professor tries to think, right? But I think you're right. We, we are such given to concrete thinking that we have a hard time thinking outside the box. And myth gives us a language for dealing with issues. I mean, really, you understand what the, the best science fiction, when you want to go back to the original uh, Star Trek or something like that. The whole reason you make an, a Star Trek episode that takes place way up there for Star Wars is so you can deal with real human issues right now in this time in this place. But by displacing them into another time in another place, we can do that. Yeah. Right. And, and that's why Lewis was saying, in, uh, you know, because he wrote his space trilogy, or his ransom trilogy, that now that our whole world is explored, we can't write. Gulliver's Travels anymore, because we pretty much know what everything is, so let's just go out in outer space. We keep going into a different unknown, but we're going there to deal with real human issues, and that's sort of what the myths do, and that's, why, and that's one of the reasons, by the way, why the great myths have not only inspired so much literature, but so much visual art and so much opera. Right? Because they, they're 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 providing the raw material, the 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 uh, archetypes for. Uh, or just the arts or aesthetics in general often. And I, I teach for our, our, our art program at HBU. And in the fall, I teach them mythology in art. And then I teach them the Bible. Because until, I mean, until maybe the Impressionists, until then, almost all art was based on one or the other, <laughs> Bible stories or, or art types. Uh, and a lot of times the same poet, the same artist would do the same thing and it almost looks the same, right? Whether they, they do a statue of David killing Goliath or Percy is cutting off the head of Medusa. They look the same, okay, because they're dealing with the same, or whether it's Samson or Hercules, they're always crisscrossing with those because they're dealing with those universal struggles, as do the great books. And that's why it's so dangerous. Now, I hope England's not as far along as America trying to get, do away with the canon of the great books. Are they doing that in your country or not? As I, much? I mean, we, we, didn't have, we didn't have much of that back when I was in school. Even already, so it's been under attack. We, this is crazy. I mean, we, uh, in my whole time in school, I, we, we, I read uh, much, much ado about nothing was probably as close as to the canon as you're going to get. Oh, there we go. You at least one Shakespeare play. That was it. Yeah, one Shakespeare, and it was not the, it's not the it? best Shakespeare. Yeah, I mean, it's fun, especially the Ken Brown version, right? But the, uh, but, but yeah. So you're, you see, again, and England's got this, you know, great, great tradition, and they're not even reading that. Uh, and, and it's, yeah, I, it's, I, I, I think that's such a such a travesty. I don't know why why they do it. They sort of 
seek to find texts which they believe are going to somehow cross the border. And <clears throat> I see no problem with here's something which is which is grown from your country. Your right. your your psyche is going to understand it in a, in a right. more intuitive way. So, but for some reason you you don't. So yeah, I mean, do you, what what do you think? What do you think is happening or is going to happen in terms of? I mean, actually, this ties into a question I had later on. I mean, you talk about uh, in the book, you talk about the decline of ages, right? You talk about gold to silver oh, yes. to bronze yeah, to iron. Ages, yeah. This idea of you know when does this decay sort of stop? It was an idea I was thinking of, and I mean, this sort of relates to what we're talking about in education. It, almost like an entropy of education yes. is. What what happens to education when when you begin to remove that form of imbuing yourself in myth and in in ancient culture and in classical culture in the I way mean, that you're the, doing with your book? The progressives are are actually insane in both of our countries because I'm serious. If you look at them, they really seem to think if I can remove every trace of the Bible, every trace of traditional virtue, every trace of the dead white male heterosexual out of my classroom it will suddenly become utopia. And of course, at the very moment they're claiming utopia, they've absolutely destroyed the whole thing. So they, they think they're evolving progressivism when they're actually, it's entropy, but it's insane. It's, it's almost pathological. I mean, they really, like, like my country right now, they're, they're, they're going insane. If I can remove every bit of this, if I can get rid of the policeman is the new thing in America now, get rid of the policeman. And, 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 you know, we're, we're seeing lawlessness like we've never seen in my lifetime uh, in this country, which is kind of insane. Um, and uh, I, I don't know. It, it, it's, again, it, it's the idea that all, it's, it's what C.S. Lewis called chronological snobbery. Newer is always better. Progressing, progressing, progressing. Uh, it's, it's this mania for egalitarianism, or what today they just simply call equity. Uh, and uh, it's amazing that in some ways it's hit your country before mine. Your country has such a wonderful uh, understanding of a good kind of hierarchy. Maybe people are tired of kings and queens. I don't know. It's insane. Um, but this desire to make us all the same. Mm -hmm. I mean, that, that, that reductivism, that sort of Marxist idea, you know, making us part of the groups. We're not no longer individuals. We're part of groups. It's, it's a very strange thing. I mean, we are part of the individualistic West. And the goal right now is to rob us of our individuality and make us part of the group, oppressor or oppressed, that's what they call crit critical race theory, just critical theory at all, uh, push us one or the other. Uh, and it's, it's getting dangerous because you know, there was a time in England when, you know, most British intellectuals went through a Marxist phase. It's just like going through a, a phase of insanity and then they come out of it, right? <laughs> uh, but they're not coming out of it now. <laughs> I mean, they're, they're crazy. So, but, but we, I mean, the real danger is they put us in a little, contemporary box so we have no idea of the past mm. i mean even the past of 50 years ago we don't really have any idea well i think i think that's dangerous. i would say i would say that maybe you'll disagree i mean i think they're doing something actually a bit more dangerous than that i think more dangerous really? to, than than forgetting the past ah. is you bring it forward Revising it. and you say we'll talk about it yeah but here's why you know so it's, it's, a, it's like taking a myth and then only attending to it and removing all of its own language, all of its own nuance, all of its own culture, oh, and then right. attending to it by your your new means, right? And you go, this is why they're wrong. This is why it's silly. And then just change it completely, you know? And uh, the politically correct myths, revisionist <laughs> mythology. Well, you've probably heard, uh, luckily this is not all over, but it's, it's in California, of course, uh, is what's called the 1619 Project. Now, 1620 is when the Mayflower landed so that's the beginning uh 1619 is the year the first slave was brought to the americas and the 1619 project is a curriculum to teach the entire history of my country as only about slavery and oppression and power mm. i mean that that so the, the kind of what you're getting at so we are going to teach you history but we're going to completely bend it and twist it uh out of recognition so it just becomes part of our agenda Mm. And that's really scary. <laughs> that's really scary. Is this sort uh, of why you and, felt the need to write your your note on virtue? Yeah, yeah, and and it's it's really funny because of all the podcasts I've done, that's often the first question because basically, and I, I speak about this a lot. It, it it just dawned on me that I used to think the problem with public education was that they threw out virtue, but that wasn't the problem. It would almost be good if they completely threw out virtue because then people would recognize the gap and would seek it. What they did is they got rid of the real virtues and replaced them with substitute virtues. Things like tolerance and egalitarianism or equity, inclusivism, uh, environmentalism, uh, multiculturalism. All of these things 
and so it, it's it's like filling you up with junk food. You you think you're full, but you're not actually getting any nutrition because all of their values are actually negative. They're not positive. C.S. Lewis said this a long time ago in Screwtape. Screwtape said, the best thing we can do is we took the positive charity, caritas or agape, we took the positive charity and replaced it with the negative unselfishness. So he was saying in the England of his day, if you ask people what is the most important virtue, they would say unselfishness. I think today they would say tolerance, which is a very similar idea. So I'm not doing it because it's right. I'm doing it because I feel better about myself. What we call virtue. They use the phrase virtue signaling there as well. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. So this is just rampant all over the place. Uh, and it, well, I was terrified. Am I right that Prince Charles, who used to be the, the old fogey, uh, trying to fight for real architecture and stuff, didn't he start to sign on to this? What are they? The big reboot? What do they call that? Uh, let's do the big restart. Restart everything. Oh, the great, the great reset. Yeah. Mm, is, okay. I, I don't know if they, they were misunderstanding him or did even Prince Charles give his imprimatur to that? Possibly. We haven't got much of that culture left. At some oh, point. it's just crazy. Mm. I mean, it's, it's just, yeah, because I remember I was so excited. You're probably too young to remember this, but Prince Charles was like speaking out against the ugly architecture in England and trying to praise, you know, the Gothic revival of the House of Parliament. And I'm like, yeah, this is the, this is the guy. Uh, and a lot of Americans were interested. Uh, a lot of Americans followed them. They called themselves young fogies instead of <laughs> old fogies. Or the young fogies, right? But it's just, oh my gosh. And, and uh, you know, with environmentalism and, and, you know, that poor, pathetic little girl uh, from uh, Scandinavia. What's her name? Uh, Greta, uh, Greta Thunberg. Yeah, oh my gosh. You know, who clearly, she's clearly on the autism spectrum, that poor girl. And they're just using her, pushing her off. I, the only thing I can say about her, I did have a little bit of respect for her. At least she took a, a boat instead of a plane. She at least <laughs> is not a hypocrite like, like all the other big leaders who have their own private jets and stuff. At least she had a little bit of the courage of her convictions. But I just feel sorry for that because she's being used. But the, um, but I don't know. I, I don't, like you said, it's all of this is a distraction. Give me the phony virtues. I mean, literally, we are raising a generation, the last two generations, where the young man says, well, yes, I do sleep around, but it's okay because I recycle my cans. Mm. It's almost, I mean, it's that's almost, not really an exaggeration. Mm. It's almost like, uh, I can't remember who said it. I should remember who said it. You know, the greatest trick the devil ever pulled is sweating as he didn't exist, right? So it's like, no, here's the virtues, yeah. and they're really easy, but because of them, you can't see the ones which, yeah, unfortunately, it's all like the Christian thing you said, right? C.S. Yeah. Lewis not wanting to become a Christian, probably because when he looks, you know, you look down at the, the rules, yeah. you go, I don't really want to have to do all that yet, right? So it's like, right. these virtues are quite easy. They're all very friendly. And unfortunately, right. you know, being a Christian, yeah, there's suffering there. Or, or, or it doesn't have to be Christianity, but, but abiding by a monotheistic re religion or a religion which has, you know, it's tough. It's tough. Yeah. Uh, so did, anybody, did anybody ever get persecuted for being a deist or a Unitarian? <laughs> I mean, that's a religion for boys, C.S. Lewis would say. Um, what a Christianity and water or something like that. But uh, just, it, it, it's, you know, yeah, there's no accountability there. Nobody comes after you for, for that, right? Uh, and, and, uh, but it, it's like, like I said, it's just, um, you know, if we really want to understand again what they call the classical virtues, courage, courage temperance, uh, wisdom or prudence, uh, justice, sometimes going back to the old stories will remind us again. And, you know, stories help us teach virtue because they embody the virtue. Mm. So we experience it. Uh, Bill Bennett, who, uh, who was the Secretary of Education in America a while back, wrote a book called The Book of Virtues. Let's go through all the virtues. This is this is why Rome was great because they all grew up on the stories of the Roman Republic, uh, Cincinnatus and all these great heroes, uh, uh, Horatius, the Cuthleys at the bridge, Gaius Lucius putting his hand in the fire. Uh, this was in our own countries. You you listen to the great stories of the great heroes, and that kept you alive. I guess, I like guess in America, you know. Maybe that's one of the points I'd make. You know, you talk about virtue being removed from education. I guess that's where you immediately have this problem. If you're if you're grown up into a default way where you really have no understanding of actual uh, virtues of, of of Christian virtues or of religious virtues, then, for instance, if you read something like uh, Lord of the Rings and you see that the very clear virtue of heroism, you literally can't you can't see it because you. That's a good point. Yeah, you're right. You can't. So how, 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 oh how do you how, how do you what do you do with that? <laughs> the little girl actress uh, that plays Lucy, jo Georgie Henley or something like that. Georgia Henley. You know, mm -hmm. She was in the line of which one. Yeah, um, I saw her interviewed about Prince Caspian when she was a kid. And she said, 
I think this book is about loving all aspects of nature. These kids. <laughs> you know, we, we, you know, in America, we, we, we used to really, really uh, envy your child actors because they didn't go bad. Like ours always just go bad. I don't know what it is about Hollywood where yours tend to have their respect. But now all those Harry Potter kids, I mean, they're not serial killers, but they refuse to talk to J.K. Rowling, who made them rich, simply because she says, you know, men should not be allowed in women's bathrooms. I mean, she, well, that's all she's saying. She's a feminist herself. It's not like she's some ultra conservative J.K. Rowling. Uh, probably actually a Christian, but of a very liberal variety. But they won't even talk to her now. These, these, these kids are so virtue signaling that they just ignore the woman that, you know, I mean, it's unbelievable. It's, it's like childish. Uh, in America, HBO made a really good retrospective special about Harry, uh, Harry Potter and all the books and all the movies. And they got everybody together. They interviewed them and stuff. But they made sure that J.K. Rowling never showed up in the full two hours. And they only showed two clips of her speaking. And they made sure the videos were before she came out against transgenderism. Mm. I mean, talk about childish, okay? But that's virtue signaling. And now people actually feel virtuous. Like, uh, I mean, he here is really the danger. We are creating a generation, not just kids, ourselves. We're creating a generation where it it it's beyond saying, oh, I the Old Testament, oh, you know, God's an ethnic cleanser, all that sort of stuff. The danger is we're producing people who actually think they're morally superior to the God of the Old Testament. Hmm. You see how that's the ultimate sort of form of blasphemy, the ultimate form of pride? It's beyond, oh, I don't know if the Bible's true. It, it's, I'm literally better than God. That's that. That's how I hold myself to a moral standard. Which is uh, a very, I mean, very it's a odd. very strange, I mean, you could almost argue that the, the older form of Gnosticism, at least perhaps you would argue that the, 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 the Gnostic myths were... You know, without revelation and those themselves are trying to find that. But right. This is like a new form of Gnosticism where you're you're actually you have everything you need to know God, right. and yet you still go, No, I'm gonna which is basically I mean, really that's the retelling of the devil, right? He, him saying, Yeah, I'm no, sure, I yeah. can do I can do better than you. Um, we're so much <laughs> more accountable now. That's why I mean, you know, we don't know for sure, but God certainly seems to hold the people in Acts more accountable than the people in, in the Old Testament, which seems to be because after Christ as Christians, we have the Holy Spirit dwelling inside of us. I mean, we do have a little higher standard we're supposed to live up to. Uh, and and uh, but 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 yeah, like I said, we we are we are really without excuse. It's all around, and and now it's it's you know, I mean, what is it? Search me, O Lord, and know my anxious thoughts. See if there be any wicked way in me, and lead me in the path of righteousness. That's that's good. Or Socrates saying, "Know thyself." That's good too. But what we do in the liberal West is we practice excessive introspection. And what introspection is the very opposite of what David is doing. Introspection is, let me study and study and study until I can figure out exactly what my parents did wrong just so I can blame them for all my ills, or society, or white people, or straight people. Whoever that happened, what, do you see, man, what do you see you the know? differences between, of course, you know, that there is a definite place for internal mysticism of the right. vein, you know, vein of Thomas Merton or yeah, Teresa of Avila. Avila. But what's the difference between that and the, the of individual introspection? What, what's the key yeah. difference there? The, the, the key difference is we're turning inward, but there is absolutely no sense of conviction or guilt or need for me to repent or change. It, I am looking inward to find out how society is to blame for why my life isn't what I want it to be. Whereas real, like you said, the, the mystics are going, and even the higher pagans in a way, right? Mm. They're looking inward so they can they, they can get a perspective on themselves and and try to grow and learn and grow closer to God's standards for us. That's very uh, interesting. And we don't do that anymore. Mm. I mean, we almost, don't even talk to ourselves in a sort of Jane Austen way of looking and looking at yourself and realizing you're being a jerk, you know? We can't even step out and look at ourselves. It's almost like a, a negative repentance, right? Repentance as yeah. metanoia, right? The, the metamorphosis of being. We no longer, everything else has to change. That's wrong. Yeah, you that's you change. My, I don't have to change. My being never has to change, which is really like a, it's like a, I guess, a Thomistic problem because Tom, you know, yeah. Aquinas says that the, the, the spiritual progression of a, of a Christian is the fullness of being. Now, I don't need to fill up. I don't need to, you know, everyone else right. needs to do that for me. I mean. Do you know what Lewis says in the abolition of man? The difference between then and now. Okay, the uh, the, the the old struggle 
was how to conform ourselves to the world. Mm -hmm. In a good sense, now. conform ourselves mm -hmm. to reality, let's say, because worldliness. And, and the way we did it was through virtue and sort of self-sacrifice and obedience. Mm -hmm. Now, we want to find how to conform reality to our own lusts. And the way we do it is through a technique of one way or another. That's why Lewis said the closest thing to the sorcerer and, and alchemist is the modern scientist who both want to use power to make nature do what they're bidding. Now, uh, the, the sorcery fell away because it didn't work, but science did. You know, it all starts with Francis Bacon, knowledge is power. And I am now going to bend the universe to myself. That's why I think there's a legitimate difference between white magic and black magic. Mm. Uh, white magic is about sympathy, about rebuilding a connection. Mm. Black magic is about power. How can I learn the right words or spells or rituals to force God or the gods or the spirits or the ancestors to do my bidding? Mm. Uh, and that's, and that's why here, okay, you know, we, we talk about the liberals, the progressives trying to manipulate man and change him. But the conservatives have been partly guilty because we've tried to do that with nature. We start by making nature into an object and forcing it to do our bidding. And then eventually we will turn human beings into a cop, right? I mean, is there really any real Tor uh, 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 Tory party left in England? No. Probably not. Well, I, mean, I, guess, I guess if you were to look at it in Christian terms, I mean, there's the big emphasis of preservation, right? Preservation of the good. Okay, they're, like they're, they're, not, they're not preserving their concept. Well, they're not conserving. No. There is, <laughs> one of my there friends is said, anything. You know, well, you know, in, in America, we have Republicans and Democrats, but they are not like Tories and Whigs. We don't have a, we have two Whig parties uh, in America. They're yeah. all about control and changing everything to fit our needs rather than ourselves preserving and changing and, 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 and understanding limits as well as possibilities well we've, we've we've started doing that thing where we say we had tories now we have high tories and i think as soon oh. as, as soon as you start you know classical liberal as soon as you start doing that oh. it's all over isn't it really i mean on, see. it's crumbled yeah it's fragmented <laughs> wow wow well um is, I mean, is there, is there anything you, else you'd like to add about, uh, we've sort of gone all over the map here, but is there anything else you'd like to add about Myth Made Fact? Um, and I would just I would just emphasize for people that this is a book you could read straight through, but this is also a, a fantastic, almost a, 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 an exercise book, not to not to downplay yeah. or anything like yeah. that. It's a, it's a reference book, an exercise book, and it's a fantastic yeah. introduction to both Christian thought and, and, and to uh, myth mythology. I'm so thankful that my editor put in all sorts of what, what, uh, glossaries and uh, indexes. You can find things. This could be read devotionally at night. And just just kind of an, an overview. The the 50 myths, and they're all drawn from, they're more Greek than Rome, but, you know, there's some Roman there, but it's mostly Greek. And and the first part are all the sort of origin stories, things like Pandora's box that many have heard of, Prometheus and the fire, uh, going through, you know, why things are the way they are, the seasonal cycle. I actually have a whole section on platonic myths, because I think those are some of the best. Uh, a bit, the best known is the allegory of the cave, but there's the myth of herb, there's the winged soul, there's all sorts of things. Uh, then I have a whole section on the four greatest heroes, and those are Hercules, Jason, Perseus, and Theseus, right? Mm -hmm. And then I have a section on the tragic house of Atreus. That's the one that takes in uh, the story of the Trojan War and Agamemnon and Orestes and Electra. And then I have a whole section on the tragic house of Thebes, which takes in not only the story of Cadmus and Bacchus and Pentheus, but it takes in, of course, Oedipus and Antigone all the way down. Then at the end, I have sections of, of love, you know, love stories and love lost and found. So I sort of cover all different uh, areas in there. But and, and, and I start by retelling the myth in my own words. I want to, you know, like, like I'm a storyteller because mm -hmm. I want people to, and I really want people to read this aloud. You can read this aloud to kids of any age or read it on your own. So it's a, you know, one stop, it's all kind of book. Uh, and, um, but it will, it will get you deep into, and a lot of times I even talk about the old allegorists, you know, how, how the ancient people read myths as allegories and things. So there's a lot of historical things in there. And of course, Lewis is in there. The golden bow i mean i cover over carl jung everybody's in there in some way or another uh in the in the notes and whatnot um but it's, it's just it's a good way to reclaim um our, our mythic past 
and to see that it can still speak to us today and it can still challenge us. One of the things, I'll end with this, one of the things that set C.S. Lewis on his road to faith is one day he was overhearing, uh, 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 who was it? Um, one, one, one of his friends, uh, and he was talking to one of his students and they were talking about Plato. And Lewis suddenly realized they were talking about Plato as if it really mattered, as if somebody might actually change their belief or their behavior from reading Plato. And that's one of the first things that really challenged Lewis to say, wait a minute, maybe I've been holding this stuff at arm's length. Maybe I need to allow myself to be challenged. And I really do think that, you know, whereas a lot of the, the children's novels are all about, you know, getting yourself winning on top and getting back at all the bullies and stuff. Myths are, they, they, they inspire in you wonder, awe, humility, and gratitude. That's why we love Narnia and, and Middle Earth. They inspire all of those things. Why? 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 Just like in America, why do the Brits, who are all against hierarchy now, love to go to Narnia and Middle Earth, two absolutely medieval hierarchical places? Because I think we're hungry for that. America, that's why Americans follow all the craziness of the royal family over there, because we don't have a royal family. Uh, we just have, you know, CEOs and stuff like that. Uh, we have the Kennedy stuff a bit. Um, so, but what I'm saying is that we, 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 there is a natural part of us that actually wants to have, you know, to, to rule, but we also want to obey, right? Uh, that, that we want to, and Lewis said it himself a long time ago, if we are robbed of true, uh, heroes and royalty and stuff, then we will just make heroes out of uh, footballers. That's how you guys would say it. Out of, out of, you know, uh, athletes, out of, uh, rock stars and things like that. So, you know, what we're going to do is instead of eating the good food, we're going to swallow poison. Mm. But we can't just do away with the part in us that yearns and desires. And so the, the myths will, I think, oddly enough, if we can get us back on track, I'm a strange Christian who reads uh, myths devotionally. And I can actually learn a great deal from them. Mm. So, wow. Well, it's, it's great to be back on, James. Yeah, it's been uh, fantastic. And, um, and if people want to know more, just go to Amazon.com and type in Lewis Marcos, M-A-R-K-O-S. That's that Greek K. And all my books are there. If you go to YouTube and type in Lewis Marcos, I've got a YouTube channel. That's all free. All, all of the lectures and stuff if you want to watch. And then, again, all, all my books are on my Amazon page as well. So and you're great, soon, great you're, talking to you. You're soon to release a an in, like a beginner's guide to Lewis as well. Oh, good! I don't know if I told you about that. Uh, okay, there there is a um, uh, publishing company out there called For Beginners. So it's like mm. Shakespeare for beginners, Plato for beginners, all these different ones, and it's a little bit more of a comic book form. Now it's not a comic book. There's like forty five thousand words. It's, there's a lot of words, but what he does is. They have all sorts of fun little doodles and pictures in the margins everywhere to brighten it up. And the, it's called it's called a, a C.S. Lewis for Beginners, and I cover his biography, and I cover all of his major books. And it's it's done in a fun, accessible way. And then I've also done J.R.R. Tolkien for Beginners. That probably won't be out, though, for you know maybe nine months or something. But I, I just finished it, and they're working on that. Uh, and my other newest books are a trilogy called The Ancient Voices Book. Ancient Voices and Insiders Look at Classical Greece, Classical Rome, and sometime within the next three or four months, or the, uh, the early church. Wow. And those are books that all deal with uh, primary material. Let's read their speeches and let's try to see the world through their eyes. As C.S. Lewis would put it, instead of studying the medieval night, why don't you put on his helmet and look at the world through his visor? So that's kind of what I do. Let's read their most important statements and let's try to get into their mindset and understand how they saw the world mm. so we can be challenged. Wow. So when are, the, when are those out? The, uh, well, the first two are already out. Oh, Greece and Rome, okay. they're on. They're Asian Voices. And the third one is due out I, probably within five months. By the summer, it should be out. Publishers uh, working on it now and giving me the final thing. So I've been busy. You've been very busy, yeah. <laughs> hey, you know, let, let's let's make good use of COVID. I'm just sitting around. All right, let, let, let's try to focus and finish all these projects that started. Uh, so... Got a little stir crazy, but I'm so glad we're we're out and about and, and life is returning and, and I hope it doesn't crash down again. I don't mm. think any of us will allow another shutdown. We're just like we're done with this place. I'd, I'd, like, I'd like to hope so. Just in time for yeah, spring. We're done. We're done. Otherwise, you guys will have your own Boston Tea Party 
and throw your masks into the, into the Thames or something like that. So yeah, it'll probably probably brighten the Thames up. So yeah. Okay, Lou, Lou Marcus. Hey, great talking thanks to you. very much.